For two days in November, nearly a million black and other non-white workers in South Africa stayed away from their jobs. It was the largest protest ever by black workers in South Africa against the racist oppression of the white minority government. I think we're on strike because uh, we've been negotiating with the company over wages, as basic salary, and uh, working conditions. It's our democratic right to take, to take this type of action. South Africa's growing black trade union movement was instrumental in leading the two-day strike and the South African security police responded quickly by rounding up leaders of the non-white unions and jailing them without charge. The arrests of the trade union leaders caused a renewed eruption of protest against apartheid worldwide. A thousand members of American trade unions picketed at the South African embassy in Washington as part of the Free South Africa movement's daily protests. Led by AFL-CIO Secretary-Treasurer Tom Donahue and D.C. Congressman Walter Fauntroy, a major figure in the anti-apartheid movement, the marchers demanded that the 21 imprisoned union leaders be freed. For the union makes us strong. Donahue was introduced by Randall Robinson, another leader of the anti-apartheid demonstrations. Today, organized labor stands against apartheid. Carry our demands for us today. We have major leadership from the American labor movement. We are here today on behalf of the millions of American trade unionists. We assemble to condemn the repressive government that's imprisoned our sisters and brothers in South Africa. For 30 years, we in the AFL CIO have decried and condemned the South African system of apartheid, which breeds those violations of human rights. We've said repeatedly that if South Africa persists in the denial of trade union rights, persists in its efforts to strip away the citizenship of its 73% black population, and persists in the forced relocation of that population, then our government must act forthrightly to assist South African workers by a selective ban on the import of South African products. We've said further that U.S. actions must continue, if necessary, to such measures as a full boycott, the barring of any new investment in South Africa, complete disinvestment, and the severing of all social, cultural, and diplomatic ties with South Africa. Today, after 30 years of protesting apartheid, it is time for America to get on with this program. Free the Union! Free the Union! As the demonstration continued, Donahue walked to the South African Embassy with two other U.S. labor leaders, Leon Lynch, Vice President of the United Steelworkers of America, and Charles Perlick, President of the Newspaper Guild, to personally demand that the 21 union leaders be released. They were arrested when they refused to leave after being told that the embassy was closed. With pressure coming from many sides, the South African government finally relented. On December 7th, seven of the 21 union leaders were released. In the wake of this important victory, American labor sponsored a special conference in Washington on the non-white unions in South Africa. Ten South African leaders came to give American trade unionists a first-hand picture of their fight for independent trade unions. AFL-CIO President Lane Kirkland talked about their importance. We do not look to government self-inspired to reform themselves. We look instead to the organization of democratic institutions, independent of the state, and defending the interests and aspirations of ordinary people against hostile state power and entrenched privilege. And that is why we have been so encouraged by the emergence in recent years of the black trade union movement in South Africa. In seeking to help them, we do not pretend to understand their situation better than they do. We do not want to define their objectives for them, only to help them carry out their own objectives. One of the leaders, Philip Lamini, had been arrested and tortured for his trade union activities. We have been in the forefront of the struggle. We have 
stay months and years without pay. We have seen our children in a hospital for malnutrition, but that won't stop us. That won't take our commitment. We know that the burden is ours. We know that God appointed us to lead our people to freedom. Fira Shah Kameh was among the union leaders who had been arrested the month before. South African workers are not looking for the amelioration of apartheid or cosmetic changes. We are looking for a destruction of apartheid and all its racist structures. For people in South Africa whose skin is not white, the struggle for freedom and basic human dignity goes back 300 years. By the beginning of the 20th century, whites had taken most of South Africa's land. They had exploited the non-white people just as ruthlessly. Like oppressed workers everywhere, black workers began to unite. The black labor movement started in 1918 when blacks formed the Industrial Workers Union in hopes it would win respect from the white government and employers. But these hopes for equality in the workplace were short-lived. In 1922, white miners went on strike to protest black employment in the mines. Hundreds of white miners were killed in clashes with the army and police. In the strike's aftermath, two years later, a law was passed that would discriminate against black workers for more than 50 years. The Industrial Conciliation Act did not even define black workers as employees. Only whites, Indians, and those of mixed race were given collective bargaining rights. This law was designed to protect white privileged. That means that the majority being blacks were not allowed the rights to bargain. The white union used this law to make sure that their pay was always better than of the black workers. In the decades that followed, black workers continued periodically to form trade unions unofficially. A series of mostly wildcat strikes in the city of Durban led to a resurgence of black trade union activity in the 1970s. The 1973 strikes underscored the importance of black workers in the South African economy. The white business community finally had to recognize that the black trade union movement could not be ignored any longer. In 1979, the nationalist government extended then existing legislation and allowed African workers the right to join trade unions. This legislation had been denied to black workers in South Africa for over 50 years. The gains made by the then existing unions are now a matter of history. This worker's anthem is now being sung by a half million members of South Africa's black trade unions. Despite this historic precedent, the South African government has never intended that non-white unions would ever be truly free. Under the laws of South Africa, the white minority continues to treat the non-white majority as inferiors. The government routinely uses terror, not only to try and control the newly independent black trade union movement, but to keep the whole system of apartheid in place. Underneath the thin official veneer, behind the facade of safari and sanity, every aspect of South African life is dictated by one's race. If one asks you, how is hell? You'll say, join me, my friend, and just go in South Africa, you'll see hell. From precarious birth to premature death, the majority of South Africans are sentenced to live in a desert of despair. The minute you're born, there's a race classification which applies to you. That race classification uh, dictates for the rest of your life where you may go to school, where your parents may live, where you may live, which university you may attend, 
uh, which type of careers you might take up. Whites in South Africa number only four and a half million. Indians account for 800,000. And they, along with the nearly three million people of racially mixed heritage, the so-called coloreds, have some limited freedom. But the 21 million Africans themselves have no real freedoms or legal rights. Blacks cannot vote, cannot move freely, cannot buy or sell land. The government does not even consider them to be citizens of their own country. Where the government does consider blacks to have citizenship as in 10 remote and desolate areas devoid of the necessities of life. Already three and a half million blacks have been driven there like human cattle. The South African government calls them homelands. These concentration camp-like areas make up only 13% of South Africa's land. Finding work there is all but impossible. Less than 20% of the black workforce has jobs inside the homelands. Job opportunities only really exist in the rest of South Africa, in the nearly 90% of the country owned and controlled by whites. It is in the cities, like Johannesburg, where the majority of black workers have jobs. But under apartheid, there is no dignity to their work, no right of residency, only exploitation, as the South African government itself has explained. It is accepted government policy that the blacks are only temporary residents in the European areas of the Republic for as long as they offer their labor there. As soon as they become, for some reason or another, no longer fit for work or superfluous in the labor market, they are expected to return to the homeland. For decades, it has been illegal for black workers to even be in the cities unless they can prove they are employed there. And today, that proof is stamped in their pass books the internal passport the government uses to control the daily movements of every black person over age 16. John Gamomo explains. People are separated into groups in South Africa. Whites are situated in their own areas. The blacks are situated in their own areas. And so-called colored people are situated in their own areas. And you must have a permit to go to so-called colored area. And the so-called colored people should also uh, get a permit to go to the township of the black people. For the tens of thousands of workers who live in these segregated ghettos, like the township of Soweto, life is bleak. They are only permitted to commute into the white areas to go to work, and at the end of the work day, they must return to the townships before the police begin enforcing the nightly curfew for non-whites. A third of the black workforce are migrants. They are legally residents of homeland areas which are hundreds of miles away from the centers of economic activity. For them, apartheid means living for 11 months a year in single-sex barracks like these, completely cut off from their families who must remain in the homelands. The cost of apartheid, in human terms, is stark. Massive hunger and starvation inadequate schooling, insufficient health clinics, uncontrolled black unemployment situation has created poverty and misery not witnessed since the depression of the cities. Sickness and malnutrition among black children is rampant. And there is only one doctor for every 19,000 blacks, compared to one doctor for every 330 whites. Deaths of black children under age five account for 55% of all deaths in South Africa, compared to 7% for whites. The lifespans of blacks are short. Black men can expect to live only 55 years, 16 years less than white men. Life under apartheid is equally hard on black women, they can expect to live only to age 60, 14 years less than white women. It is apartheid's exploitation of female workers that has led women to take leadership roles in the black trade union movement. If you are working and being pregnant, you will work till the last day. And uh, after delivery, 
you must come to work as quick as possible because they will say you, you must stay at least two weeks and you must come to work. If you don't do so, you will be dismissed. Economic exploitation of non-white workers, male and female, is a central feature of apartheid. The system ensures that the best jobs and highest pay go to whites. In South Africa's important mining industry, white workers receive more than five times the average monthly wages as blacks. In manufacturing, black workers are again on the bottom. The lowest paid of any non-white workers, blacks get average monthly wages that come to only a fourth pay to whites. But under apartheid, black workers are strictly limited in the ways they can protest. One core right denied to black trade unionists is the right to strike. The right to picket is also denied to South African workers. In fact, uh, no more than five people may gather in an open space uh, to have a public meeting. All meetings larger than five people have to have the permission of the local magistrate. Uh, this severely curtails freedom of association and the right of assembly in South Africa. Despite the official oppression, the police violence, the jailings, and the torture of labor leaders, the black trade union movement is not only growing, but also effecting change. Despite the state harassment, despite torture, today we have, we managed to improve the living condition, we managed to improve the workers' pay. Today, South Africa is one country where unionization of workers remains progressively high. From a position of virtually no collective contract, black independent unions have concluded over 400 agreements affecting over 2 million workers, whilst representing some half a million workers in over four years. The surge in union membership has been accompanied by a willingness by black workers to defy the law and join in work stoppages and strikes. The potential power of blacks in South Africa is in their sheer numbers in the workplace, from the mines to the textile mills to the docks to the auto plants, it is the black men and women who make South Africa work. Today, blacks make up more than 80% of South Africa's workforce, and by the year 2000, black workers will hold more than 90% of the jobs in South Africa. Because of the South African economy's increasing dependence on black workers, the black trade union movement will continue to grow. But the struggle for their most basic rights and freedoms continues. The South African government's official campaign of violence has escalated. And the leaders of the black trade unions are appealing to trade unionists around the world for help. Brothers and sisters, we need your help. We know we cannot go far without your help. Without you, our struggle will take some another 200 years. Shortly after Philip Lamini and the other black trade unionists returned to South Africa, their struggle was the focus of a meeting in Washington of the Brussels-based International Confederation of Free Trade Unions. Headed by John van der Vecken, the ICFTU represents 82 million trade unionists in 98 countries. I can tell you that the ICFTU's program of solidarity action that means assistance in the field of education, trade union training, legal assistance, organizational assistance has been going on for the last five, six years and has now uh, assumed proportions that I can safely say that never in the history of the ICFTU we have had a, a program of the magnitude which we have in relation to South Africa presently. AFL-CIO President Lane Kirkland told reporters covering the conference why trade unionists worldwide are supporting the black unions in South Africa. We believe that the most potent and most effective force for democracy and for peaceful, effective change in that country is the black trade union movement. And we are going to support, encourage, and take part in the pursuit of every avenue it's open to us 
to afford those unions a maximum opportunity to carry out their work and exercise their rights. As a follow-up to the ICFTU calling for an end to apartheid, the AFL-CIO's executive council asked Congress to adopt a package of economic sanctions against South Africa. The AFL-CIO executive council urged Congress to pass legislation that would ban new investment in South Africa, end all investment guarantees, export credits, and trade promotion with South Africa, stop new international monetary fund loans as well as other loans by banks to the South African government and publicly owned companies, halt the sale of Krugerrands and the purchase of South African coal, embargo the sale of arms to South Africa, especially those used by its military, security, and police forces, compel disinvestment by all multinational companies in the energy and high technology sectors, and force divestment by all multinational companies that have been identified by the South African Black Trade Union movement as being in violation of internationally accepted labor standards. As the anti-apartheid protests continue, it is South Africa's oppression of the black trade union movement that makes the involvement of American labor unique. In the AFL-CIO, we are black and white. We're male and female and old and young, all together. We are the broadest cross-section of society that exists in America. Together today, we speak here not alone of black issues, or white issues, but of human issues, of labor issues, of issues, issues which unite all workers. If our sisters and brothers are enslaved anywhere, if trade union rights are denied anywhere, then freedom is threatened everywhere. Keep up our faith.